Hi everybody, today I have a unique tutorial for you. I came across this website this past week and it's just a regular EdTech website. It has some graphics and it has a few elements. And my thought was that I wonder if I could recreate this in Canvas. What would a website like this look like in Canvas, but building it actually in Canvas and not just using an iframe to put another website onto my Canvas page? And what I came up with is this page. And this actually pulls from several different tutorials that we've covered in the past. And so I wanted to pull on what we've learned together and use those resources to create something that kind of looks like a web page. So I'll get started and talk about the different elements that I have on the screen. So first and foremost, we have a banner. And this banner I created in Visme. It took a couple of minutes. You could also use Canva as a platform. And of course, if you had image editing software like Photoshop or GIMP or even PowerPoint, then you can create similar banners. The element that I pulled from one of my past tutorials is at the bottom here, I put this drop shadow and it's an offset drop shadow. So you can see it on the Y axis that it hangs below the image, but it doesn't go off to the left or the right and you can't see it above. It's only a thin shadow that's on the bottom as opposed to this other element down here, that's an offset shadow on both the X and the Y axis. So the shadow pops around the entire edge. And we have an entire video dedicated just to this effect called Drop Shadows in Canvas. And I'll put a link to all of the video tutorials that I pull from to create this page in the description below. Another thing I wanted to highlight is I have this header and then I have this text here and you notice that the text falls on two lines. And in order to do that, I used a CSS technique that we cover in a video called CSS with properties in Canvas. Now you could just write the text out and you can put a hard or soft stop and have another line. But what I did here is that I actually said, I want this text to span 50% of the width of the page. And I also said, I don't want it to be any wider than 800 pixels, like if it's a really large resolution screen. And I don't want it to be fewer than 400 pixels. And so let me demonstrate what that is. If I minimize this screen and I adjust things here, here, let me go ahead. I'm going to highlight just this first line to begin with. And then if I were to collapse the course navigation, that changes the width of the screen. And so you can see this other word comes from the second line and fills the first line because the width of the screen is now different. But then if I collapse this screen, then you can see that the width of the line again is different. So now it breaks into four different lines. And that's where I get this effect that if the width of the screen changes, then the amount of words that are on there change and it just naturally fits. And if I were to look at this like an iPhone screen, you can see how on the large screen that normally would be two lines. Now it's four lines and you can even see the break where that happens. And of course, if I start enlarging the screen, then it changes in value. And so I want that to be responsive. And so that's why I don't want to hit a hard return and have two different paragraphs. I want it to just be one paragraph and one reason I put the width of 50% is that I don't want the line to go clear from the left side of the screen to the right side of the screen. I don't think that one single line would look good. I want it to be broken up. So again, I have a couple of shadows. I have this CSS width property. And then as I scroll down here, I have a parallax effect. And we covered how to do that in a video called Parallax in Canvas. And not only that, but we also have some overlay text that you can see on top of that parallax. And this is an effect that we covered in a video called Text Overlay and Parallax in Canvas. Now this is purely aesthetic, it's just an ornamental thing, but it really makes your course pop. It really is an interesting interaction if you can get away with it. And then once again here, you can see that I'm playing with the width, so it doesn't span the entire width of the screen, I have it a portion of the width. And again, that will be responsive if I change the width of the screen. You can see that adjusting and so that it looks good no matter what size of the screen. Because you don't want to design just for the screen that you're on, because you might be mindful that some of your students might have very large monitors and some of them might be on mobile devices. So as we continue hovering down, I have an embedded YouTube video, and then I have another banner. I made this one also in Visme. And then down at the bottom, in order to mimic what the other website did, I actually looked at their code and they use Bootstrap. And we can use Bootstrap in Canvas. So I have a video called Bootstrap Grid in Canvas that shows you how to create columns that are compartmentalized and also that look good if you're on a small device, such as this is what the image might look like on an iPhone. And you can see that it still kind of makes sense. It's not ideal, I'll be honest. It looks best in the large monitor here, but it's still functional even on a mobile device. 
for these thumbnails here, I put this interesting hover effect. You can see as my mouse hovers over, then it gets a shadowy glow. And we discussed how to do this in a video called Interesting Hover Effects in Canvas. And the last thing I'll note is that I use this little icon here for these links. And we discussed how to do that in a video called Buttons with Pop-Up Boxes. Now normally this wouldn't be accessibility-wise a very good thing to do. You don't want to say click, click to learn more. You should use narrative hyperlinks. And so the student, when they click on the hyperlink, they shouldn't have any question of where they're going to go when they click on the link. So you might say click here to access the syllabus or click here to view this interaction. These links are a little ambiguous and I don't like that, but I was just tinkering more with the layout and aesthetics than the actual accessibility because this isn't a Canvas page that anybody's actually going to be interacting with. Another accessibility faux pas would be right here I use a header too for this text just because I wanted it big. In reality, your headers shouldn't be that many words or characters. I think it's 120 characters. Anything that size or more should just be text, like a paragraph, and you can blow up the font size, but I was just lazy, and so that's an H3. I think these are also H3s, and that's probably not a good use of an H3, but I thought it looked nice. And so going through once more, we can look at the various interactions. We have a graphic banner with a drop shadow. We have text that's formatted with CSS. And then we have an image that has another drop shadow element to it. We have this nice parallax effect with the overlay text. Another group of text that has CSS. We have a drop shadow around our video here. And another banner that I made in VisMe. And then we have this bootstrap grid with various elements like these hover effects and icons. Okay, let's pull back the curtain and we're going to take a look at the code on how I created this page for all those who are curious. So first of all, I made this image in a different platform. This was in VisMe, but I uploaded it into Canvas. And then the customizations that I did in Canvas were if you look, first of all, I have a class and that class is shadow and that's a shadow I created on a different tutorial. And that's what adds this little bit of shadow at the very bottom right there. Another thing I did was I went into the style and I said I want the width to be 100%. And that way, whatever, regardless of the width of the page, the banner is always going to take up the entire width of the canvas page here. And so the rest of this is just the image, the rest of the banner. The next element down here is a header. And for the header, I have that text align centered. That's something you can do in the rich content editor. And then I put a margin of 25 pixels because on the other website, there's a little bit of space and you can see the space in between the image and the header and the text. And that's about 25 pixels right around there. It's kind of a cushion of 25 pixels. And if you want to learn more about that concept, I actually have a video called Understanding Margins, Padding, and Borders. And it's essentially how we can get space around elements without hitting a hard return, just using CSS code. And that's what I did right here. I just used CSS code to push everything away from this element. And now we have this text right here that I told you it takes up 50% of the screen. And I can see that right here. Normally HTML, the paragraph is just a P within the angled brackets. But here I put some additional style. I said, I want this to take up 45% of the width of the page. I want it to be centered. I want there to be a margin of auto, which means it's the same on the left and the right. I have a maximum width. I don't want this text to be any wider than 800 pixels, but I also have a minimum width, and that minimum width is 400 pixels. And so even if it's a small screen, I'm essentially telling the browser that I don't want this to be any, any smaller than 400 pixels wide, even if the screen is smaller than that. And that number is arbitrary. I just picked that number because the image below is also 400 pixels wide, and so I'm saying, yeah, let's not have this be any smaller than the width of the picture. And then you can see my text right here. And I have a picture. The picture is within a paragraph. It's centered. I put a margin on the top and on the bottom, which is 50 pixels. And so you can see that space. It gives it a little bit of space so that the words aren't coming right onto it and the other element isn't coming onto it either. Other than that, it's pretty much a straightforward image. One of my favorite things that I have ever discovered in Canvas is how to create these parallax effects and then with the text overlays on top of that. And it's a little bit complicated. If I isolate it, we can look at that code. And this is the code to make that happen. It's essentially everything is within a div that says class overlay content. 
And then the image itself is this div right here. I have a class with parallax and then overlay dash lighten. So this image is actually lighter than the original image. And that way I can put some dark text on it. And then the background image I got from Unsplash. I determined the height. You have to specify the height of your parallax in pixels. And then the width, I just put 100%. And so if I were to blow this up big, then the image would take up the entire width. And when I have it small, then it just uses the real estate available. Now I mentioned in our other tutorial when we're talking about parallax, this has to be in a div, and then you have to have a space in between the div. And the space doesn't show up on the screen, but without that space, then Canvas is gonna scrap it, and they're gonna say, oh, there's no content there, and they're gonna throw it all away. So as long as you have a non-breaking space, then you're good to go with your parallax image. And then for the overlay content, you can grab this code from the blog and all I did is change the text in there. It was just copy and paste. And then you get this interesting effect, this parallax with the text overlay. The next text is the same as what we, what we explored up here. I have a paragraph and I set the maximum and minimum widths. So in this case, I said I want this to be 45%. I want it to be no larger than 800 pixels wide and no smaller than 400 pixels wide. I changed the color and then just put in the text. The YouTube video, I just grabbed the embed code from YouTube and placed it in there. The only difference that I did was that I said, I want this to have a shadow one. And I specified shadow one as this shadow that comes across all borders right here. And then I also wanted some space between the text right here and the video. And so I put in some style. I put in a margin top of 25 pixels just to kind of push that stuff away. Next, we have a regular image, and the only thing I changed with this is I put some margin on the bottom. You know what, let's make a real-time edit. I'm noticing that this banner is out of frame, and that's because it's a fixed set of pixels. And so let's find this. This would be the image that is right here, and we're going to make a change to that. So I have some style pulled up right here with the margin at the bottom, and then I'm going to add to that. I'm going to put a width of 100% similar to how I did with the banner up at the top of the page. And then we're going to go ahead and save this page and let's refresh. And now when I scroll down, then you can see that banner spans the width because before a moment ago, when, since my screen is a little bit smaller, it was spanning all the way off the screen. And so I'd have to go over to the right in order to do that. But I think I just want to make that 100% regardless the width of the screen. And so as the screen gets bigger, then the banner will get bigger. As it gets smaller, then the banner will get smaller. And my one caveat is that with this banner, I have text on it. And a lot of times I like making my banners with no text just because I don't know how small the screen is. And I want to make sure that it's still legible. Like this would be really hard to read just on this screen. And this is what students with a smartphone might see, something very small like that. And so it's a good practice. Make your words big or don't include words at all. Another thing I'm noticing that's kind of breaking on my screen here, and this is a medium screen, so it's not full blown like my regular screen where this looks nice. Instead, it's a little bit smaller, and that's this um, the box grid effect that I have. And so full disclosure, I probably have some tinkering to do to make this look perfect. I'll show you what I did though. And so this is from a tutorial that's called Bootstrap Grid in Canvas and you can see my bootstrap. It's starting right here where it says div and there's a class that is grid row, grid dash row. And that's me saying, I'm going to apply bootstrap at this point. And so to start the bootstrap, this is a little bit tricky. I did, I think I was a little bit clever, but obviously I still have some tinkering to do, but essentially I created two different columns. There's a left column and there's a right column. And each column is set to six. If you remember the tutorial, Bootstrap divides the screen, the width of the screen, into 12 equal portions. And so when you say, I want this column to be 6, that's 6 out of 12, which is 50%. And so I have one column here that is 50%, and then I have another column here that's also 50%. They're both set to 6, and then when the screen is small, they're set to 12. And that gives me the effect that when I shrink it way down, then it takes up the entire width, all 12 columns. And there would be 12 tiny columns, whereas if you have a large screen, the columns would be a little bit bigger. Anyway, so we have an entire tutorial talking about Bootstrap in a lot more detail and with more examples so that you can understand it. But for right now, I have this column here. The column is set to 6 and 12, and all of the content is center aligned. 
I have some padding, which is 20 pixels. And honestly, that might be what's causing this right here, this overlap. It might be because I have that padding right there. So let me go ahead and take that off. Let's, when I minimize that and just have a margin, then I should be able to save that. I think that might solve the problem. So let's reload the page. All right, so that's what that was doing. The padding was pulling the things over and now they're sitting uncomfortably close to each other. And the reason why is that this is set for six, which is exactly 50%. This is also set for six, which is exactly 50%. And so if I didn't want that space there, maybe I could put some padding on the left of this column. So let's go ahead and try that. We're kind of exploring in real time. And this is a little bit different from the approach that I usually take. I usually like to have a polished presentation to show with you, but this is kind of interesting too. We can explore a little bit together. So in this case, I already have some padding set for the top and the bottom. So what I might try and do, I might be getting in trouble, but what I want to do is put padding on the top, not on the right, on the bottom and on the left. And so what this is saying right here is that the top and the bottom have 20 pixels of padding. The left and the right have zero pixels of padding. And so instead, what I'm going to do is it goes top, right, left, bottom. So top is 20. I'm going to go right is the zero. The bottom is 20 pixels. And then I'm going to put 10 pixels on the left. Let's go ahead and save that and see if it does what I want it to do. Okay, perhaps I can live with that. Now there's a little bit of space in between the two right there. I might want to tinker with that more in the future, but for right now, I think I'll let that go. And let's explore some of the other elements that we have here. So right here, again, this is looking at this column. We're looking at two different columns. There's a left column and the right column, but then the right column has two columns of its own. And so you can see I started another div called grid-row, and that's the second time I've used this class. But it's essentially, it's kind of like the concept of having a bullet list within a bullet list. So this would be my second bullet list. And this time I have a column of four. So this is taking four out of 12. I have a new 12 that's right here within the half of the screen right there. And then the column on the right would be a column of eight. So it's four and eight, or in other words, it's 33% and 66% on the right right here. And so that's how I created this effect. And then I just put an image and the image has a class and the class is hover-glow. And we covered that class in a video called Interesting Hover Effects in Canvas. And that gives it this appearance that when I hover my mouse over it, then it interacts with my mouse and it glows. So within this column, I have three different rows. One, each row has a picture and some text and a hyperlink. And you can see an example of a row. This would be one of my rows. I have my div that explains the column width and then I have a picture, and then I have another column that explains that width, and then I have an H3 with a few different properties and some text, and then I have a hyperlink, and then I close it out. And then I do it all again right here for this next row. And so I have bootstrap within bootstrap, and that gives me this effect that I was looking for. Anyway, this is not a perfect example of what a web page might look like in Canvas, and I'm not really a web developer or a web designer. I'm more of somebody who tinkers, and so I just wanted to see what could we get away with on a Canvas page and pull together various different tutorials that we've learned over the past several months. If there is anything that you would do different, then please let me know in the comments below, especially if there's anything that you would add or something that you would omit or alter. And if you have other ideas or suggestions, you can also reach out to me directly. Follow me on social media. We have Instagram and Facebook and Twitter. And you can find links to all of the blog posts for all of the interactions that we incorporated on this web page in the description below. Go ahead and explore those, grab my code, and use them in your own sandboxes. And I'll see you next week. Happy Disney morning!